the wannabe Prime Minister and the former Prime Minister in an ever more dangerous world. Has a new era of action taken off? American and British strikes on targets in Yemen. Retaliation for Houthi fighters' audacious attacks on ships in the Red Sea. Prime Minister. They happened while the Prime Minister was en route to another conflict zone to promise more UK help for Ukraine. We need to send a strong signal that this breach of international law is wrong. The bombing of Yemen was backed by the Labour leader too. We do support this action. With Keir Starmer hoping to follow these two into Downing Street, hoping his picture will one day hang there too if he wins. The polls and real votes at by-elections suggest Labour is well on course. But there are months to go before the real test will come. So our one big question this morning, how should the UK's leaders cope with crises abroad now in an increasingly uncertain world? Who better to ask than the Foreign Secretary, David Cameron, now a member of the House of Lords? But if he makes it to number 10, how would Keir Starmer deal with evolving threats around the globe? Morning, morning, and with me at the desk for the show, the actor and all-round superstar, Alan Cumming, journalist Isabel Oakeshott, and for the first time, the editor-in-chief of The Independent, Geordie Gregg. A very warm welcome to all Thank of you. you. And as we've got them both here this morning, Keir Starmer and Lord Cameron, I just wonder, um, Lord Cameron, you were leader of the opposition for a long time. You're now leader of the opposition, Sir Keir. It's often described as the worst job in British politics. It is. Have you got any tips for him, Lord Cameron? Plenty. What might they be? Get a plan. Keir Starmer, anything you'd like to hear from David Cameron that might be helpful to you? Well, the uh, 2010 experience when he went from opposition into government would be interesting to discuss. But we've got a plan, he'll be pleased to know. OK, well, we'll hear more from you shortly in the programme. Let's first of all start with what is making the news in the papers and online this morning. Both of our guests have already been busy. David Cameron's told the Sunday Telegraph the UK had no choice but to strike the Houthis in Yemen. On the front of Geordie's paper, The Independent on Sunday, Keir Starmer accuses Iran of sponsoring terrorism. The Sunday Mirror is marking 100 days since the war between Israel and Hamas began. And The Sunday Times has more on the post office scandal, claiming that Paula Venels, the former boss, was given her CBE honour despite warnings being raised at the time. And in the last half hour, news agencies have been reporting that four migrants have died trying to cross the channel to get to the UK. We'll bring you more details on that this morning if we're able to get them for you in the next 60 minutes. Right, you three. Something important has happened this week, of course, around the world with American and British military strikes. Geordie, do you think that's going to change the tone of our political conversations? It's definitely. I mean, there was a scramble for, for leadership and trust in what happens with these very very uncertain um, difficulties, um, how to keep the highway safe, how to not get into a war, how to show strong, strong moral control of what the argument is in what we do as a nation and, and our role in the world, with huge necessity not to get over-involved and this to become a wider conflict. And that's what we saw in The Independent. We saw Keir Starmer saying how he wanted to try to combat the injustice of pirates, of people doing wrong, getting involved, echoed by David Ca um, Cameron. So we are seeing a scramble for let's be the grown up in the room. Let's try to find a way to show strength, authority, trust and moral common sense. That's a tall order though, isn't it, Isabel? I mean, it is often, it's risky for politicians to take military action, isn't it? Well, at the moment we have near political unity mm. on this from both the government and the opposition. And I mean, look, this stuff is hugely important. Absolutely it is. And uh, yesterday we saw huge demonstrations in central London over some of the related issues. But if you look at polling now over what matters most to British voters, in an election year. At the top of the list is still the economy, mm. 
followed by health, followed by immigration. Uh, so I don't think we should get too carried away about the extent to which this will shape the way voters plan to go. But it's interesting, Alan, though, we've had in the last 24 hours or so British politicians saying things like the Prime Minister and the Foreign Secretary, this is potentially the most dangerous time in the world that we've seen for decades. Do you feel that as a, as a citizen? Yes, I've, I'm terrified. I mean, I was pretty terrified before, but uh, it is a very, you know, it's a... It's just an accident waiting to happen. I think it's interesting, Jordi talks about uh, this moral obligation. I find it um, hard to sort of countenance the idea that we'd have these attacks, we take action when mm. our economy and when the shipping routes are being threatened, rather than taking it for compassionate reasons at the beginning of the, the attack on Israel and the, and the war in Gaza. That, to me, is a sort of sign of where our uh, politicians are at. Lots and lots of dilemmas there to unpick with our guests this morning. Well, events that sometimes seem a million miles away have been brought close to home this week. The Prime Minister says the world is the most unstable it has been for decades after taking what was his first military action, airstrikes against the Houthi rebel group that is backed by Iran. It's been attacking ships travelling through the Red Sea, risking trade, and of course that risks higher prices for us all. So on Thursday night, America and Britain said, enough. Well, the Houthis control most of Yemen. You can see where its crucial position is in the world on that map, a country that's been plagued by conflict for years, but it controls the Red Sea coastline. This morning, I spoke to the brother of one of the main Houthi leaders, Hussein al -Bukhati. They have made it clear uh, that they only target uh, Israeli-linked ship or uh, a ship that is heading uh, toward the uh, Israeli port. Uh, and they have said, even though with the attack uh, from the UK and as well from the United States, uh, they will not stop because they are, they are at war uh, with uh, Israel. Because at the beginning, uh, before even uh, uh, targeting any ship, they have declared war against Israel and have uh, uh, launched ballistic missiles and drones against Israel. It is very clear, though, the Houthi rebels have been targeting ships that have nothing to do with Israel breaking international law, endangering innocent crew on these ships who've got nothing to do with this conflict whatsoever. What is the international law uh, uh, on what's going in Gaza? The genocide, the killing, the, uh, the, the mass uh, bombing. Uh, that's why here uh, in Yemen they believe that those uh, rules actually uh, they are set to uh, oppress uh, uh, countries uh, like Yemen and like uh, Palestine. The Houthis have said there will be retaliation against the US and the UK for these strikes. What does that mean? I believe if United States and UK will continue uh, their attack, uh, Yemeni forces will uh, uh, um, um, attack uh, United States uh, battleship and UK ship, maybe using hundreds of drones and uh, missiles and cruise uh, missiles. Mr. Abakati, thank you so much for joining us from Sana this morning. Well, the Foreign Secretary, as promised, is here with us now. Welcome to the studio. Good to have you here for the first time. We've just heard there, far from stopping these attacks, the Houthis are vowing retaliation. It's clear from speaking to that man there, they've got no intention of following your action with the cessation of what they're doing in the Red Sea. What's given you the impression that this will make any difference? Well, I would turn the question around the other way and say, well, look what's happened since the 19th of November. We've had 26 attacks on ships, not just ships heading to Israel or Israeli-linked ships, but ships of all kinds and those attacks have been getting worse. We've given warning after warning. We've taken the case to the United Nations, had a very clear statement there about the importance of freedom of navigation. And yet the attacks continued. And in fact, one of the last attacks, which included HMS Diamond, uh, the British destroyer, involved over 20 drones and missiles. So not acting is also a policy. It wasn't working. And it's right we sent this very clear, very unambiguous message that we are prepared to follow our words and warnings with actions. But what makes you think it will actually stop the attacks? Because perhaps it might have been worth it as a punishment, but do you think it will actually stop a single thing? Well, I think there are two things that it does. The first is it does degrade some of the Houthi capacity to launch these missiles and drones, and we'll obviously look at the assessment of that in the coming hours and days. But it also sends this very clear message that uh, America and others uh, an alliance of countries backing this action, an alliance of countries including Britain taking part in this action, but also including countries like the Netherlands and Canada and Australia, are prepared to take action backing their words. And I think that's very important. And are you prepared to keep going? If the strikes keep happening and America keeps asking, 
Will you keep going? Well, we are prepared to back our words with actions. That is what the Houthis need to know, and that, I think, is, is the right thing to Without do. Without limit? No. Look, of course, we look at all of these things very carefully, and I want to sort of make the point. It's quite interesting going back into government and watching this Prime Minister, who is very meticulous and careful and looks at every question. Are there alternatives? Has every other policy been exhausted? Have we consulted uh, with colleagues? Are we looking at the effect on the region? I mean, he is, goes into every detail in completely the right way, but then is a strong and determined leader who wants to take the right action to try and stop these appalling attacks from happening. And that's the way he will approach it, and I think that's entirely right. What you didn't do, though, was consult Parliament. Now, it's been reported in the last couple of days that the decision was actually taken on Tuesday. Is that true? Well, we've had a range of meetings going back some time, because, of course, as soon as these attacks started, uh, we, with others, have been looking at what can we do to try and stop uh, this action in the Red Sea? How do we keep this vital shipping lane open? And of course it's not just the goods that come here and the effect on our economy, this is also you know, grain being taken to desperately this is all, poor this, countries. But this is about why you didn't seek the consent. Okay, let me, let me answer that very directly. So we've given all these warnings, including warnings that have been given in Parliament, and all, in my view, the Prime Minister followed all the correct procedures, assembling ministers, listening to advice, listening to legal advice, consulting with allies. And there will be a statement in Parliament on Monday. I don't think it would have been right to have a debate and a vote before this sort of action because I think it is important for reasons of operational security um, to on this occasion take the action and then have a statement in Parliament afterwards but as you'll hear from Keir Starmer he was briefed on this the Labour Party are supporting this action so I think we're doing this in exactly the right way. Let's talk about the wider forces at play here then now you've said it's nonsense to say these strikes uh, what the Houthis are doing are about the conflict between Israel and Gaza, except their very clear view expressed very firmly is that it is absolutely the Houthi group taking action because they're unhappy about what is happening in Gaza. Well, of course, that's what they say, but they've attacked every sort of ship going through the Red Sea, including ships flagged in India or Singapore, and it's unacceptable to allow this um, to continue. And I think I, I do separate the two things. Now, of course, when it comes to Israel and Gaza, that we're doing everything we can to get aid in. We took a whole series of steps last week with the Israelis to say they've got to do more the, to get, let the number of lorries going into Gaza to go up. But the point and is, also we're doing everything we can to try and get to that sustainable ceasefire. But the point is, Foreign Secretary, you can say as much as you like, these two things are separate, they are not connected. That is not the way it's seen in the region. These strikes have been interpreted by the Houthis and by others in the region as absolutely part of the very dangerous jigsaw of what's going on but, in the Middle East. But, and your Defence Secretary, Grant Shapps, has connected this to wider things. He said to Iran, we see you. He's talked about Hezbollah and Lebanon, Iraq and Syria. He says, we see you doing it. So your Defence Secretary is linking no, no, this to I, wider I completely issues agree in the region. With, with, with Grant Shapps that you can see what, Israel, what, what Iran is doing in the region with its proxies of Hezbollah and Hamas and the Houthis and, of course, the Iranian-backed um, uh, militia groups in Iraq. In all these occasions, uh, they are playing a very malign role, and it's absolutely right that we call it out, both publicly, as Grant has quite rightly done, and also I had a call with the Iranian Foreign Minister to make precisely this point. What did you the say point to him? I said that the Houthi action is unacceptable, it is illegal, it is dangerous, it could well result in the severe loss of life and the sinking of ships, and it has to stop. They have considerable influence over the Houthis. We know that they've supplied them with weapons, and they should act. And I think it's important to be able to have that uh, conversation. I wanted to make sure it was as clear as it possibly could be. But does the UK and US action not risk escalation? No, the escalation has been caused by the Houthis. I mean, the point is, since the 19th of November, you've had these 26 attacks. There have been more of them. They've been getting worse. And, you know, not acting is also a policy, and it's a policy that doesn't work. We've seen the escalation take place. So what we're doing is saying, your actions have a consequence. We've given these warnings. We've very much treated military action as a last resort. The strikes themselves were limited, proportionate, targeted, legal, but they were also necessary. But I think it's also worth you know, standing back from all this, as you did in your introduction, and saying, look, this is a time when it's hard to remember a more unstable and dangerous and un uncertain well, I want, world. I want you know, to... Very much the, the, the lights from where I sit in the 
Foreign Office, the, 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 the red lights on the global dashboard are very much flashing. And at that moment, it's very important that you have in number 10 Downing Street someone who is a strong leader but takes all of these issues into consideration but has a clear it, plan for how we enhance this country's but security. But it does feel, as you've said, if the red lights are flashing, many people, and including also people who are sympathetic very much to the UK, like the UN this week have warned of escalation after the American and British strikes. There is what Iran describes as an axis of resistance to Israel. We then see Iran having links with Russia and China. You've said then the red lights are flashing. Should people watching this morning feel worried? Well, feel they should insecure? certainly feel worried about the level of, look, we've got a, a war in Europe. We've got instability in the Middle East. We've got more wars taking place in Africa at the moment than there have been for decades. We've got the terrorist threat that is always with us. But added to that, we've got the state threat of states taking action against uh, people in this country. So you've got a whole range of threats, quite aside from climate change and other things we could talk mm. about. And that is exactly why you, you need a government that is thinking very carefully, how do we enhance our security? How do we keep our alliances strong? How do we work with friends and partners? How do we strengthen our defenses against terrorism? How do we make sure our defense budget is capable of doing all the things we, we need it to do? And I think in one of the reasons I came back into the government is I look at Rishi Sunak as a very strong, capable leader. Not only capable because he's got a huge brain, but capable because he's got the right values. Would it That's help, the key. Would it help, however, given how dangerous the world is, then if you called much more robustly, much more firmly for Israel to end its bombardment of Gaza. It's been going on for a hundred days now. The Hamas-run health ministry says more than 20,000 people have been killed. Is it time now for the UK to say enough? There must be an immediate ceasefire. I think it's time for us to say two things. One is a humanitarian pause where we can get aid in and get hostages out would be really helpful and we would support that straight away. But on this question of a more general ceasefire, I want it to be sustainable. And you can't have a situation where Hamas are still in power, still launching rockets, still capable of launching terrorist attacks uh, against Israel. That's not going to be a sustainable ceasefire. So, of course, you know, it can make you feel better to call for an immediate all-round ceasefire. But if it's not actually going to be sustainable, you're not really doing something that's going to bring this situation to a but close. But you said and this week in is you're worried Israel may have been breaking international law. Doesn't it require then a firmer le level of protest or rebuke from allies to the UK? I think we have UK. been incredibly firm. Of course, we are a friend and ally of Israel, but we do not hold back in the conversations we have with them about applying international humanitarian law, mm -hmm. about crucially, right now, what I most want them to do is to allow ships to arrive at Ashdod port so we can get aid into Gaza that way. We've got about 150 trucks a day going into Gaza with aid. We need that to be 500. There are people in Gaza who are hungry and could be starving. There are people who are ill and we could see real outbreaks of disease. We need that action now. It's not just Israel that needs to act. The UN needs to do more. The Egyptians need to deal with bureaucracy. We need to make the aid available. But there are a whole series of steps, including making sure that the UN has the, 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 the trucks, the people and the fuel to distribute that aid around Gaza. A whole set of steps need to take place right now. And we don't hold back from making those points to the, the Israelis. Of course we don't with all of these dangers that you have described, would it help if Donald Trump returns to the White House, a politician who you described as behaving in protectionist, xenophobic and misogynistic ways? Well, we have to work with whoever the United States chooses their president. And one of the things I saw uh, as prime minister is with Barack Obama and I got on very well, so that was okay. But you can have disagreements, you can have Prime Ministers and Presidents of very different political hues and different approaches, but we have to make that relationship work. It's one of the things that actually helps to keep us safe in the world. It's not some grandiloquent gesture by the United Kingdom. What I care about is do we have the intelligence? Do we have the information? Do we have the partnerships to keep our own people and our own country safe? And that relationship with America is absolutely vital in doing that. So whatever the Americans choose to do, we will have to try and make it work. You are a diplomat now, I noticed, and uh, not, not repeating language that you've previously used about Donald Trump. Let's see what happens in America in the coming months. 
we have a little bit more information now about what happened in the channel uh, it seems in the early hours of this morning four people have died 72 people have been rescued and it's been reported by french news agencies it sounds like this is another very distressing incident and yet more evidence that after many years of trying to grapple with this problem your conservative party has been unable to stop this unable to protect vulnerable people unable to stop what many people think is a ghastly illegal trade well it's it's heartbreaking when these things happen and the loss of life that takes place and you can only think about what a what an appalling end it would be in the the cold waters of the channel in the in the middle of the night it, it breaks my heart to hear about it but it, it it just shows we've got to stop the boats we've got to stop this illegal trade in human beings. Now, we have done a huge amount. We've given a vast amount of money to help the French with their policing and intelligence operations. We've done a vast amount in the channel itself. But ultimately, the only way you can stop the boats is by busting the model of the people smugglers, by making sure that if someone goes from point A in France to point B in Britain, they do not stay in Britain, that that route doesn't work. Now, in an ideal world, you'd just send them straight back to France, and that would be it, and the whole trade would collapse. That is not available, and that is why we're pursuing the policy with Rwanda. That's why the bill will be passed next week. That's why the treaty has been signed. Um, and yes, it may be unorthodox or unusual, but unless we can get flights off and get that system working so people know there's no point getting on that boat in France, because if you get on that boat in France, you're not going to be able to stay in the United Kingdom. Once we've done that, we'll be able to collapse this trade even more. Be aware, yes of course, no. it is, is down. This, uh, and this is coming back to Parliament this week. Yes or no, yeah. as now a member of the House of Lords, will this get through the House of Lords? Well, I hope so. I'm Sadly, I, I don't have a personal majority in the House of Lords, but I'll do everything I can to help get it through, because it's essential. It is actually, of course, it's about dealing with illegal migration. It's about shutting this down. It's also about saving lives, as you've just shown. There will be an interesting debate on that in Westminster in the coming days, no doubt. Let's then talk a bit about you and your return to government and what you were doing while you were out of office. You, out of office, pursued various different business interests, commercial interests. Our viewers might remember that you worked for a firm called Greensill Capital, a financial firm. Now you contacted former colleagues in government on their behalf. Um, a committee of MPs, there you are with Lex Greensill, a committee of MPs found that you had showed a significant lack of judgment. Now you've answered some of these claims before, but you have never before said how much money you were paid. Documents seen by the BBC say that you received about £10 million. Is that true? No, it, that isn't true. I mean, so the first how thing, much the did first, you receive? First thing is, while I was out of office, the most important thing I did was to help Alzheimer's Research UK raise millions of pounds for people battling with dementia. That was the number one thing that I did. I've had to stop that. Now I'm coming back into government and I have just that one job. This issue on Greensill has been examined, as you say, by all these committees, by all these inquiries. But you've never answered how much money you were paid. And now you're back in government. That comes with scrutiny that I'm sure yes. you understand as someone who's in frontline politics for a long time time. How much money were you paid I, by Greensill Capital? What I've done since coming back into office is obviously resign every other job I have. I've given all the information to um, the person responsible for uh, registering a minister's interest and they have the information about the jobs that I had and the things that they, I did and they are able to, they make a decision about, about declaration. But of course during that period I was a private citizen between mm -hmm. 2016 and when I took this job. But I think uh, our viewers I worked for a would believe that it is relevant that you were a former British Prime Minister, so there's a definitely a public interest in what you did during that time, and now you've returned as Foreign Secretary. Yes. So there will be, our viewers will want to know. And you say you've registered all your interests now, that's perfectly legitimate, but why won't you tell people how much money you were paid? There was a, there's a figure out there you say is wrong, tell us the right one. Well, because I was a private citizen, I had a number of different interests and things I did, including important charitable work. And I think as a private citizen, you're entitled to do that. And that's what I've done. But very clearly, on coming back into government, I resigned every single job, every single position, everything I did. Then you make a declaration of uh, your interests. You have to uh, explain companies you've been working for to the, the person who registers these interests. And that's some... Um, and then that's what they decide to publish. You are now back after a period of absence. I think we can show people you taking your red arm in, in the House of Lords. Um, what was it like when you were out of government watching your party tear itself apart during all of those chaotic Conservative years? Well, it was obviously a very difficult period for 
the country and for the Conservative Party. I, I took the view that on leaving office, the best thing to do was not to comment, uh, not to give a running commentary on what was happening. There are often moments when I wanted to speak out, but what I they? think the job... Well, the whole point is it's hard enough being Prime Minister without having all your predecessors telling you what to do. So I was relatively silent. I think there were one or two occasions I spoke out about particular things, but on the whole, I tried to say very little. I also did not go and sort of refresh a whole lot of relationships with European leaders because we were doing important negotiations in Europe and I didn't want in any way to go behind uh, the back of, of, of government. In some ways, maybe that's made it easier now to come back in um, because I'm now responsible for a lot of our relationships with, with European leaders and our relationship with the European Union. Um, and so I think it's perhaps been helpful that I haven't set out a million positions since 2016. Mm -hmm. I, I hated leaving in 2016, but I think it was the right thing to do because the country had made a choice and it needed new leadership. And I think sometimes when you leave office, everyone must make their own choice, but my choice was to get out of the way. But you weren't quite done, and now you're back. David Cameron, we're very pleased to have you in the studio with us this morning. Thank you very much indeed. Do tell us what you think of what he had to say, and in a few minutes we will be talking to Keir Starmer, the Labour leader. And as with David Cameron, we will focus a lot on what has been happening around the world. So let's see what our panel had to make of what the Foreign Secretary will say. And remember, you can tell us what you think. You can email us or send us a message on social media. Jordi, what did you think of what David Cameron had to say? Well, the great Rolls-Royce is back. You know, he's smooth, he's persuasive, it powers along. There are definitely bumps in the road, as we, as we discovered when you asked about some, some financial questions. Um, he's also, there was a slight element of have we been there before? Tremendously good explanation about why we should go in with Houthi and why, and why we should be defending against bad things. Did you literally just say the great Rolls Royce is back? Did well, he, you say that about well, think, David Cameron? Uh, well, he's very smooth, but he's such the, the, a flatterer, the, honestly. What did you think? I could feel both of you at your muttering. I thought that was a fascinating interview. You covered a huge amount of ground there. A lot of things stood out. He didn't deny that these strikes won't actually make mm -hmm. a huge amount of difference. He didn't deny that the decision was taken several days before any of the rest of us knew about it. He is, of course, probably still very bruised from that historic moment when he did ask the Commons mm. whether they would approve strikes on Bashir al-Assad in Syria, in in Syria. Yep. You know, and the Commons said no that and that was a huge humiliation so I thought that that's was the, very that, that, very that, very that, interesting. That's the groundhog day isn't it do we worry that he's actually going to try and persuade us to get into foreign territory foreign um, disputes with with weapons with our soldiers Without, that, asking. without asking. But can I just pick up on one quickly? The Greens Hill issue. This is the lobbying. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was fascinating. You challenged him. Mm -hmm. Was he paid £10 million? His denial was a very, very weak one. I think you were in the right ballpark there. Oh, well, we will see what happens if other people try to pick up on what really happened in that quite murky business. Alan, what did you think of it? Um, so I haven't made Alan Cummings speechless. I'm speechless. I don't think that has well, ever I mean, happened in the history of the world. Just first of all, that we have a foreign secretary and who is unelected and is the person who took us out of Europe. And this is the person who is in charge of our foreign policy as a government. That's pretty terrifying, number one. Secondly, this man is saying that he believes Rishi Sunak is a strong leader and has a, a, a huge brain. I mean, to Again, be fair, he that's... does have a huge brain. I mean, his academic credentials are, well, I think, are I think without he's a question. I think Do you know, the disaster uh, no. of Boris and the disaster that's of That's not the trust, point. I think he's, he stands up We could up talk for hours well. about the disaster of but Boris. But why just, do you say that, Alan? Because I feel he's just talking the talk and just spewing out stuff like, yes, like a smooth Rolls Royce. And I feel the... <sighs> You talked at the end about the way that he had used his power and his access to government for his own financial gain. Mm. And yet here he is back in government, unelected. And I think it's just another example of the way that the Westminster does not listen to the people. I mean, These politicians are not listening. I mean, you remember also the Rolls Royces can crash. You're trying to rescue one of your Rolls Royce. But let's talk about some of the substance of what he said, though, yeah. Jordi. I mean, he was very clear. I think his metaphor was that the red lights are flashing around yes, the world. Yeah. Back, back to the car metaphor. Red lights, exactly. Oh God. Yeah. But what do you think that actually means for us? What does that mean for our viewers watching this morning? Well, the worry is, 
are we getting into something which we can't get out of? Does it, does it become a bigger thing than this small attacks? We've got to remember that the Houthis have got their foot on the windpipe of our bread, our oil, our gas, our trade. What has been, been argued by both Starmer and Cameron, I think is correct. But yes, there are amber, definitely lights flashing, you also, possibly red. You also can't deny that the, in, the action in this way is, is connected to the war in Gaza. And that I found that the Foreign Secretary saying that, that it was not about that, this action was not about mm. that conflict. It's insane. And there's even a battle over setting the terms of this debate, isn't yes. there? Well, all three of you, thank you very much for now. We'll hear from you after we speak to Keir Starmer. Last week, the Prime Minister told us repeatedly we must stick to the plan. Labour's new pre-manifesto says, not surprisingly, the opposite. It says that it is time for change. Well, Sir Keir Starmer's been on the road this week in the northwest of England pushing that message. But events around the globe are top of the list for us this morning. So, Sir Keir, welcome to the studio. Good morning. Um, let's start with that. We're going to begin, first of all, with what we know about what happened in the Channel. Now, the details are limited, but we do know that four people have sadly died. 72 people have been rescued. What's you, what do you make of what we know? My first reaction is a human reaction. Um, this is a tragic loss of life. Um, there will be family members and friends um, grieving at the awful way in which these four individuals lost their lives. I don't know the details. In a sense, we don't know, need to know the details mm. to lose your life in a small uh, dinghy or boat in the winter sea in the channel is just awful. And I'm sure that's where everybody starts on this issue. David Cameron also said it was heartbreaking as you've ex expressed your own sadness about this kind of event. But he also made the case that this displays why the government should take the kind of radical action doing something as dramatic as saying actually migrants are going to be sent to an African country rather than continue with what is a failed model of asking the French to do a bit more and it doesn't seem to make much difference. What do you say to that? I think he's wrong about uh, that. I absolutely agree that we need to stop these channel crossings. Um, they're dangerous, we've lost control of our borders and we need to do something to stop the boats. Now, I think the starting place for that is to go after the criminal gangs that are running this vile trade. If you look at what's happening, those boats that are being used now are bigger than they were. They're being made to order. They're being brought across Europe to the north coast of France. And then people are being put in those boats. It's a vile trade. It, it makes for the traffickers millions of pounds. Now, I think that we need to smash those gangs. Which is very similar to what the government says too, well, and that doesn't seem to change very much. The National Crime Agency is already working on this. When, before I was a politician, I was the chief prosecutor for five years um, of England and Wales. We had to deal with terrorist plots. We had to deal with those that were smuggling guns and drugs into our country. The way we dealt with that was to join with other countries where those gangs were operating and take them down using data, sharing intelligence, having joint operations. I've done this before. I am convinced that it can be done in relation to these gangs. That's where I'd put my political muscle, if you like, rather than a gimmick, which is the Rwanda scheme. So I'm absolutely up for this challenge. I know we've got to get to grips with it. I went over to mm -hmm. Europol to talk to them about what sort of further agreement we could do with them. But having seen this done for terrorist gangs, having seen this done for guns and for drugs, I refuse to accept uh, that we can't, that somehow these gangs are untouchable and we can't do anything about it. Let's talk then about the military strikes taken by America in Britain this week. Now, you were briefed, you endorsed the attacks. David Cameron was explicit that this might happen again. Would you back more of these kinds of strikes? We'll look at the case the government puts forward. They, you're right, they did brief me, a secure briefing uh, in relation to this um, shortly before the operation, and that's as it should be. Um, we support the action that's been taken. Obviously, there needs to be a statement in Parliament mm -hmm. tomorrow from the Prime Minister and a debate in Parliament about it. At the moment, um, what I've been briefed about is the operation that's taken place. 
I'll have to listen carefully to whatever the government but, says but, about any further action uh, that may be needed. But theoretically, you might do it again. That's, that, that's clear. Do you believe, like the government does, that Iran bears some of the responsibility of these attacks? Do you think Iran's an enemy of our country? I think that there are clear links, obviously, to Iran. That's no issue on that. But I think it is important to look at what Houthis are doing in the Red Sea, because those attacks were taking place. They were ramping up and escalating and sitting back and simply doing nothing in that situation uh, is not an appropriate uh, way to respond. And that's why I back the operation that the government briefed but me But you've on. written very strongly in The Independent on Sunday today about the wider threats from Iran. Do you think Iran is an enemy of our country? Well, I don't want to ramp up the rhetoric. I do have serious concerns, as most people do, about Iran. The activities that they are involved in around the region, you listed it with the mm. Foreign Secretary. Um, and of course, there are sanctions in place in relation to Iran. So I'm supportive of all of that. I'm deeply concerned about this. But I do think that the operation that took place just a few days ago was very clearly an operation to deal with the Houthi attacks in the Red Sea. This is commercial shipping. That's These are not civilians the view, on though, those boats. in much of the Arab world. That's not the Houthi view, and that's not the view in much of the Arab world, that actually this is about this wider pattern. Well, I think that's hard to sustain when you look at the targets of the attacks in the Red Sea, uh, which look to me to be pretty arbitrary. But in the end, Laura, what you're putting to me is that somehow there should be no response to these attacks in the Red Sea. I don't think that that's appropriate. I haven't actually met or talked to anybody who says the right thing to do is simply to allow these attacks to happen. If they escalate, so be it. Nobody thinks that. So action had to be taken. I was pleased to be briefed about it. Um, we supported that action. The Prime Minister needs to make a statement. If there is to be further action, and I don't know mm. because I've not been briefed on that, I would expect that briefing. I'd expect the Prime Minister to make a statement and we will consider it on its on merits. On a case-by-case -case basis. Some of your colleagues, though, and other opposition parties have said that Parliament could have and should have been consulted as a matter of principle and someone you know rather well used to also believe Parliament should always be consulted as a matter of principle. I just want to show you something. I would pass legislation that said military action could be taken if first the lawful case was it, for it was made, um, secondly there was a viable objective and thirdly you got the consent of the Commons. Now it was one of your own solemn promises to your party members that you would make it mandatory under a Prevention of Military Intervention Act that there would be the consent of Parliament. Have you changed your mind? No, there's no inconsistency here. There's really? Obvi there's obviously a huge distinction between an operation uh, the like of which we've seen in the last few days and military action, a sustained campaign military action usually involving troops on the ground. That's recognised by everybody. National security must come first. There will always be urgent situations where Parliament can't be consulted beforehand, but the principle that if there's to be a sustained campaign, if we're going to deploy our troops on the ground, that Parliament should be informed uh, there should be a debate, mm -hmm. the case should be made, and there should be a vote. I do stand by that mm -hmm. in principle, absolutely. But that small print was not in your promise that you made to your party. You didn't say only in certain kinds of situations. So are you saying that only applies if you're actually talking about boots on the ground? Yes, because what I said when I made that pledge was that what I wanted to do was to codify the convention, the cabinet manual, as you mm -hmm. know, um, has this in it as a convention. The Foreign Secretary now, when he was Prime Minister, um, really established the convention, which is if there's to be a sustained campaign, the deployment of troops on the so ground. So the small print is then, about the sustained then, campaign. Would well, you of do course, that if I mean, you, Laura, if you Laura just bear, bear, hear me out, because what um, David Cameron, then as Prime Minister, did was, I think, right, which was to say, if we're going to deploy our troops, there has to be a viable case and that should be put before Parliament and the information made available as far as it can and be. If you there has to be a proper legal basis because we're deploying our troops and, you, and there should be a And you've said that already, but I'd like, I think our viewers would like to know, if you win the election, will you still introduce that law? Well, I want to codify that. It could be in a law, it could be by some other means. But yes, I'm, I'm absolutely clear that that's a principle that I want to see but you won't commit entrenched. To, but you, but well, you won't commit to passing it as a law, I, I'm which not you ruling used out, to. I'm not ruling out law. 
Um, but Laura, of course there will be urgent situations, mm. particularly when we're on joint operations, where it simply isn't possible always, or even wise always, to consult Parliament beforehand because of the disclosure of information. And that's why, um, having been briefed on the operation this week, um, I haven't uh, called for anything more than the statement that I'm expecting tomorrow. from the Prime Minister tomorrow. You also said back then that you had a commitment to review all UK arms sales. Would you still do that if you win the election? Yes, we do need to carry out that uh, review of all arms sales, yes, of course. And would you, as you used to say, stop selling arms to Saudi Arabia? Well, we will do a review uh, to look at uh, the sales, look at the countries and the relationships that we have. Obviously, uh, that follows a review. But you used to say, you said in February 2020, we should stop the sale of arms to Saudi Arabia. Is that still your position? We will review the situation and the review will give us the answers to those questions. So you may not anymore promise to stop the sale of arms to Saudi Arabia, which is what you used to say in 2020. We will review the situation. The review will make clear what the position is. I think today you are perhaps slightly backing away from some of the things that you said a few years ago. So you said when you made your prevention of military action promise, it wasn't there in the small print that you only meant sending boots into the ground. You've just but said I, that I you challenge that, Laura, because I made it very clear when I was saying that, that it was to codify the existing convention. It's absolutely clear from the Cabinet manual, it's absolutely clear from what David Cameron did as then as Prime Minister, that that was about a sustained campaign with troops on the ground. I'm not sure Nobody, that all Labour no, activists listening to you but no, un understood that but complexity. Laura, but on this point about no, no oh. Labour activist has ever said to me, if urgent action is needed, we should stop that in order for Parliament to be convened. But, but on this arms sales, isn't, this but on isn't arms something sales, that is put. But on arms sales, you used to say you would stop the sale of arms to Saudi Arabia. You're now saying that you might not do that. I said would we review mm -hmm. and we will review. But do you think, though, that people on the left who listen to promises that you made to them in 2020 and even people who've got to know you as op opposition leader have heard quite a few times you shifting your position on things? Now, there's nothing wrong with people changing their mind. But do you accept that sometimes you give people that impression? There are contradictions between the Keir Starmer of 2024 and the Keir Starmer of 2020. Well, Laura, we're in a different position when it comes to geopolitics and the conflicts that are going on. And obviously, uh, we have to adapt to the situation in front of us. But let me just push back on this wider point, because um, Labour Party members are predominantly, overwhelmingly behind what we've done with and to the party, to change the party. Four years ago, we were picking ourselves up, bruised from a terrible election result. And most people, the, the pessimists in the party, thought that the Labour Party will never ever win an election again. The optimists thought it would take us at least 10 years. We have ruthlessly changed the Labour Party, put ourselves in a position where we can credibly contend in the election this year and the overwhelming majority of Labour Party members and supporters are delighted and because but, but the reason that they join the Labour Party, mm -hmm. the reason they're active in the Labour Party is because we want a Labour government. And a lot of uh, your colleagues would say that you, and, and, a, and a lot of your colleagues would say that you've got to that position actually by being ruthless about ditching some of your own positions. And one of the things that many Labour members and many of our viewers also care about is a ceasefire in Gaza. Now, we are 100 days into the conflict between Israel and Gaza after those appalling attacks by Hamas into Israel. The Israeli bombardment of Gaza has been intense and has created enormous suffering. We can all see that every single day. Is it time now for you as Labour leader to say, enough, there must be a ceasefire? The United Nations has said it. Emmanuel Macron has said it. Is Keir Starmer now going to say it? You describe the situation in Gaza and it is intolerable. Um, the sheer number of deaths, particularly the percentage of those, the proportion of those that are children, the desperate need for humanitarian aid, the fact that hostages are still being held effectively at gunpoint, this is intolerable. And I do think we need a sustainable ceasefire. The question is, how do we get there? I think the first step is we need a truce. We need a humanitarian truce that allows the space for a number of things to happen. Firstly, for humanitarian aid to get in in much greater quantities and volumes than it is at the moment. Secondly, 
we have to have those hostages released. It's very difficult to see how you get to a sustainable ceasefire until that happens. But that, a sustainable that truce, ceasefire. That truce provides the space for the dialogue that is needed then towards the political process, which in the end is the only way through this, to a two-state solution. So, so our viewers will hear clearly this morning, you are, you are not yet going to put yourself in a similar position as Emmanuel Macron, who says, ceasefire, Israel, stop. Well, Laura, sustainable ceasefire. The question is, how do we get there? I think immediate truce, calling off the hostilities to create the space, humanitarian aid desperately needed uh, in much greater volumes coming into Gaza to alleviate the awful situation there, um, the release of hostages, and then thought, of course, about those displaced in this conflict must be allowed to go home um, and to rebuild and, and, their and homes, and there can't be any question of an Israeli that. military occupation. So that's the process, the roadmap, if you like, mm -hmm. that I see towards a sustainable ceasefire. And you've outlined that. Just before we move on to matters at home, um, your party's been complaining about Rishi Sunak using private jets, except we learned this week that you accepted a private jet flight, in fact, from the Qatari government. Isn't that a bit of a contradiction? Well, let me explain that. It's very straightforward. I was at COP28 over in Dubai. Um, I had a meeting with the Emir of Qatar, um, organised. He had to go back home, uh, but desperately wanted that meeting with me. This was to discuss the hostage situation um, in Gaza, the cessation of hostilities in Gaza, um, and offered to fly me to have that meeting with him, which we could no longer have in Dubai, where so, I was. So, so why is it not OK for the Conservative leaders to take private jets? And it's well, OK for the, you to take a private jet flight? I think there's a distinction that most people really? understand. Well, I'll explain it, and then um, uh, a distinction between um, flying uh, uh, in the circumstances I've just described and using private jets to jet around England when trains would get you there nearly as quickly. But, but look, I mean, the, the, the long and the short of it was that um, in Dubai, I was having a number of discussions with international leaders about climate change, as you would expect. But of course, I was having a nearly equal number about the conflict in the Middle East. Um, how do we have a sustainable path to that ceasefire? Uh, and the Emir of Qatar, very important player in this, particularly at that point when there was huge pressure on the situation with hostages. Um, he wanted that meeting. The only way I could have that meeting was to well, go and see him um, on a plane which he provided. There are plenty of scheduled flights, actually, between Dubai and, and Doha. And you said you wouldn't take World Cup tickets from the Qataris. You wouldn't go there because you're unhappy about their human rights uh, record, but you took a freebie flight from them. Laura, you know very well what these conferences are like when we're trying to fit in back-to-back -back meetings with world leaders. It is an opportunity um, to have conversations which will take months to put together in a programme back here. I wanted to take the opportunity to have that one-to-one so -one were, discussion so with the Emir it. about really important international issues, and I, and I stand by that. Okay. Let's talk about an important issue at home. Now, one of your central promises to viewers, we've talked to you about it before, we've talked to Rachel Reeves about it at length, is green jobs, green energy, that by the end of the parliament, if you win, you'd say you'd invest £28 billion to create. The tricky thing is, you started off promising the 28 billion extra every single year. You're now saying that money might not be forthcoming and you'll only spend that much if you can afford it, except you're still promising people the goodies, the green jobs, the green energy. Now that doesn't stack up. If you're not committed to paying the price, how can you commit to the promise? Well, let me be clear what we're committing to. We've got a green prosperity plan. That's a, gro that's a growth plan about the next generation of jobs. There's a revolution going on in terms of green energy. Other countries are in the race. We need to be in the race for the next generation of jobs. I also have committed to clean power by 2030. That's renewables. That gives us cheaper bills. It gives us energy security. So Putin can't put his boot on our throat and it gives us the next but generation the point of is, jobs. The point here, Kirsama, and we're, we're short on time, the point is you're promising those goodies, but you're not anymore committed to the cost that you used to say you would definitely cough up. That doesn't stack up unless you're suddenly going to find the money somewhere else and put taxes up to pay for it. Well, hear me out, because in order to get to clean power 2030, we do need investment. And I'll come back precisely to your point. But also, when we're talking to those that we hope will partner with us on this journey to deliver clean power by 2030, they say to me, Kia, look, investment is one thing. 
but we also need the planning rules change because it takes far too long to do anything in this country. We need the national grid to move at a much faster pace because at the moment it's giving connection dates for the 2030s. That's never going to work. We need an industrial strategy. Of course we need investment and I'm very pleased to make the case for investment in the future. And that's why we will invest £28 billion in total by the second half of the Parliament, subject of course to what the government's already assigned to put in on green prosperity and of course within our fiscal rules. So I think that's, that's straightforward but I do think this idea that it's only the money that counts, it, it actually isn't reflected in the conversations I'm having with those that we want to partner with us. And for every pound the government puts in, we want to trigger three pounds um, of private investment because I think when a government invests, they're entitled to get the returns for the British taxpayer. OK, and finally, a yes or no, will the £28 billion investment definitely be in the Labour manifesto? Well, in the way I've just yes. described, then yes, of course. Yes, of course. Keir Starmer, thank you very much indeed for coming in today and covering such a range of topics. Interesting to talk so much about foreign affairs when, of course, very often in an election campaign, we speak almost exclusively about domestic. So great to have you with us this morning. So what do our panel have to make of that? They had plenty to say about David Cameron. What did they think of Keir Starmer? Alan, were you convinced by what he had to say? Convinced. I, I think if you were to look at these two people you've interviewed today, if you didn't know anything about them, if you're from another planet. Sometimes feels like that. <laughs> indeed. But which one would you think would be a better leader, a more compassionate person and a more inspirational person that you want to lead your country? I would say Keir Starmer. Absolutely. Is it disappointing that he has gone back on some of his promises? That he uh, is disappointing me that he went to Qatar after he said he would never visit there because of the human rights abuses, oh, especially I a man that who was reasonable. Actually, I well, thought he made a really strong case on that. Yes, Are we did, really I, getting I, I so petty? I was petty. disappointed in someone who said he stood up for the, 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 the against the huge human rights abuses it, it, in Qatar, and then he went. But as politicians get nearer power, they have to make compromise. Uh, absolutely, Isabel, Jordi. Isn't it the vision? and the detail and the persuasion which people want from the small boats, which you know, is, is not a policy I, I, I think, um, sent into Rwanda, I don't think is, is, is a great idea. But I thought he was very it's, weak on that, actually. Uh, I mean, by the way, I think the Rwanda policy is completely insane. ridiculous. Um, but he's, you've got to focus on the pool factor. All he can say again and again is we've got to tackle the vile gangs. This government has been trying to tackle the so-called vile gangs, and they are vile, for a very long time, completely ineffectively. But I think what really will make the headlines out of your interview uh, is his U-turns on those positions which will, uh, which will really upset the left of the party. He said, we have ruthlessly changed the Labour Party. And many of us will agree with the U-turns he's made, but a wing of his party will be infuriated at that backtracking on the commitment he made to ask Parliament to approve military action. He kept on trying to make a distinction mm. about this being yes, about boots about, on the ground. Yeah. By the way, back when that vote took place on Syria, we were never planning to send in the army to Syria. So that was a complete nonsense. Also on sales of arms to Saudi Arabia, let's not be beating about the bush any further here. He kept on saying, we'll review it, we'll review it. Basically, that means he's rode back on that. So you think clearly he's ditched two Completely. other things. Completely. Completely. Jordi, what about the position on a ceasefire? So, you know, he talked about a sustainable ceasefire, which is about having a truce, allowing humanitarian aid into Gaza, which, of course, you know, everybody would want more help to get in to alleviate that suffering. But there are many people in the Labour Party who absolutely want him to say, stop the bombing, have a ceasefire. Do you think it matters still that he won't go there? I think it does matter to a, a large part of the constituents he's trying to do, i.e. The, 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 fur, the further left. And a lot of young people But what well. he's also trying to do is to get elected. And what's key to him is to be the centrist social party, not an extreme party. He's, he is trying to be Blair light. He doesn't have the charisma of Blair. He doesn't have the, the silver tongue of Blair. Um, let's hope he doesn't have the um, ill judgment to go into Iraq like Blair did, um, which was the end of Blair. So there are many things he's which he's got to do is to keep, keep on track. But let's not forget, he is hugely ahead in the polls. He's in the fortunate position. He doesn't have to do very much. 
He doesn't have to over-inspire. He just have to be, be there. If he is ahead in the polls, he should inspire. He should, if, he's the, if he is in a confident position, show he who you are and show, again, not listening to the people, not listening to the public. He should be showing the British people that he is inspiring, that he cares, that he is different to what we've had before. And no disrespect, Gloria, but a lot of that, that uh, you're just doing your job, but a lot of that interview Trying, was, was anyway. about <laughs> nitpicking and catching him out. And I just think, I'm really done with all that in politics. So we just want to hear. Like to have heard? I would like to hear more of his heart, and I would like to mm. hear more of what he actually feels. I mean, both the interviews we've had today have just been incredibly professional. These are both very, very yes, experienced politicians but, but, who know how to yeah, bat off tricky men questions rather than compassionate, inspiring leaders. And it, that's it's not what real, I think, we're I think is what you're so saying. For a few yeah. seconds, I thought you were saying that I was being terribly professional. You, you have been all course, very professional, right. that was a giving us very interesting <laughs> insights. We are going to hear now from what you thought you sent us in lots of your thoughts during the interview we heard your emails but I promised you we'd hear from you about what you made of David Cameron Patricia Wittick says we should stop doing everything that the USA asks us to do this action is dangerous and wrong Paul in Liverpool told us I find it amazing that Mr Cameron won't declare his salary when he was working for a private company a disgrace Alexander Duguid said, I'm still far from convinced about Starmer. There are lots of pledges, but how are they going to do all the things they say? How indeed will both parties grapple with all the issues on their table in the next few months? But before we go, we're going to have a bit of fun because it's been heavy, important discussion this morning. So I have a question for you and a question for you. Would you be a traitor or a faithful? <laughs> now, if you've been living under a rock, The Traitors is a huge hit series here and a huge hit series, obviously, across the Atlantic, where, Alan, you are the host rather yes. than Claudia Winkleman in ever more incredible costumes. I think we can show the audience some of you uh, in the show. <laughs> when you look at our politicians, who would be a traitor and who would be a faithful? But I think the very uh, fact of being a politician means that you are uh, using all the traits of a traitor. <gasps> You're automatically Basically a traitor. Automatically a traitor. <gasps> because you've got to... I mean, the thing about the show is that we, we watch people lie mm -hmm. who have to lie. And sadly, that is kind of the very definition of a politician. Oh, goodness me. Isabel, you know Westminster well. Who would you say would be I've the got top to traitor? I'm, the I'm afraid I've got to nominate Michael Gove, <gasps> the ultimate <gasps> Machiavelli. I mean, this is a man who stabbed Boris Johnson in the back and then went on to somehow ingratiate himself back into government. Yes. A, a brilliantly successful Machiavelli. Geordie, who'd be a you know what, there, there, there's, it's, it's a two-way street, this betraying or, or, or not betraying. Boris would consider that Rishi betrayed him by stabbing him in the back. Yeah, Rishi true. would consider Boris had betrayed him by stabbing him in the back after he left, left number 10. Which links to what you said, they're all as bad as each and, other. And uh, I think we would all agree that Rishi Sunak's going to be banished. And, and also, just to be fair it's to... a long way till the election, Also, let's not Geordie. forget that Starmer would be accused of treachery by Corbyn and vice versa. It's everywhere you it's, look, it's, this treachery. It's, it's infamy, and, uh, infamy. and also, Alan, you're everywhere you look as well. You're in the UK with a new West End show. Tell us briefly what you're up to. I'm doing a sort of cabaret solo show called Alan Cumming is Not Acting His Age tomorrow and Monday at the Theatre of Drury Lane, then in Manchester, then in Glasgow. And it's a show, um, sort of cabaret show I sing. I tell stories all on the theme of getting older, uh, which is something that uh, clearly we're all doing. Really charming. Yes, really what are you charming? What are you saying what? here? Come on, we're all getting older. We're all ageing. <laughs> although some of us are you well, know, seeking help in other ways, but we're all doing it. We are all getting older. Although I hope we don't all feel too old after a very interesting 60 I feel minutes I've aged 10 this years morning. this morning. Oh, my goodness. Me. Well, thank you all so much. It's been great having you here as a trio this morning. Thank you, of course, for being with us this morning. It's been a big few days where Rishi Sunak took his first military action clear there might be more to come. But our politicians across the board are having to lift their gaze from what happens at home to the new dangers around the world. We've had a flavour of how Keir Starmer might deal with them if he wins the election. Rishi Sunak will be pushed on his approach when the Commons meets tomorrow. And there'll be more debate in Westminster this week about his controversial laws to send migrants to Rwanda. A big week ahead. In a few minutes, I will join Paddy O'Connell for this Sunday's newscast. There he is, waiting for our uh, next programme. As ever, you can watch anything you missed on the iPlayer. And I will see you back here next Sunday, same time, same place. Goodbye.